We're here in Toronto, Canada, in the heart of Hollywood North, home to thousands of actors chasing the dream of being on the big screen. For many actors, their journey starts at the Toronto Monologue Slam, Canada's largest acting showcase. Every month, actors perform in front of a panel of industry professionals for the title of Monologue Slam Champion. On tonight's episode, two of those actors will perform their own original monologues with the hopes of making it to the finals. Welcome to the Toronto Monologue Slam on Bell 5. on the Toronto Monologue and, and I, I like sewing with Sergey, and I liked Portuguese film appreciation and beekeeping with millennials. Just incredible and very generous work. And so really beautiful writing and very well performed. If I were to take a right here and use that as black face paint, rip out a human brain, suck the blood off, and then spit in your face, I don't know where I'm going with this anymore. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful work. It's, it's so beautifully written and richly rewarding, and I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> Next up, ladies and gentlemen, we have another beautiful performer, and her name is Sarah Camacho. A round of applause for Sarah! <laughs> Hi, I'm Marnie, and I have OCD as if you didn't already know that. So, uh, big week. Only clean the apartment 12 times. Well, a baker's dozen, give or take a couple. Stop looking at me that way, Steve. You still carry around that stupid teddy bear, so. Sorry. <clears throat> the point is, I actually got some sleep this week. I even let my mom not use a coaster on Wednesday. Oh, and uh, I actually did my homework. I left the house for an hour, went for a walk. There was all this buzzing. <laughs> and all these probably unvaccinated prepubescent kids running around who seem to be playing who can make Marnie uncomfortable the fastest, but I powered through. And then something magical happened. I was feeling nauseous, so I ran into the local coffee shop to vomit, and when I asked the barista for one of those stupid keys with the long pieces on it, which FYI, I'm sure have AIDS, but the point is, for those 10 magical seconds, when I was looking into his deep blue eyes, I, I wasn't thinking about how he's gonna have to amputate my hand for holding this disease-ridden shoehorn with keys attached to it. <laughs> it was like, for years I was in this prison, you know, feeling buried alive under a mountain of idiosyncrasies of my own creation. But this barista was like my savior. I mean, it's, it's like, he knew everything about me, and he was just saying, Marnie, come. I can help you. I think that's what they call love at first sight. <laughs> so anyway, after I ran to the bathroom and vomited, I, <laughs> I cleaned out my hair, rinsed my mouth, and he took my number. <laughs> well, hold the applause. I mean, Stacy, I clap for you when he finally buried your stupid cat, you <laughs> Sorry, that was rude. <clears throat> now, I'm not up to speed on the whole texting game, but like, it's been 83 hours and 47 minutes. I mean, shouldn't he have said something? I mean, anything? Maybe I still had vomit in my hair and he took pity on me, but like, it just felt so real. <sighs> I've been getting this itch too, the back of my neck. My skin is like red. And it's been happening ever since those little things were running around. I mean, I've had the chicken pox before, but you can get them again, right? That wasn't a rhetorical question. God, I mean, I have the cleanest apartment in all of Toronto. I bathe, I take baths and showers, I wax. I never let my pubes get out of control. I said, stop looking at me that way, Steve. I mean, I brush my teeth so hard that my gums spew blood like the Niagara Falls. What more do I have to do? Oh my God. It's him. 
Yeah. Uh, lovely, 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 lovely. I love it. And I love the writing. Really crisp and has such amazing pace. It's quick and smart and gets reaction. And you do that all the way through. <laughs> you did exactly what you came to do and you take notes very well because uh, even notes that you got today, you, you, you added them flawlessly without you know, getting in your head about it. And I think uh, that was perfection, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of this whole job is being coachable and just hearing the note and just going, right? Especially when you're dealing with your own material, right? It's hard to get notes when to adjust your yeah. own stuff and you do that so well. I love the pacing, so great. When you do the yelling with Steve or whomever, hold it. Okay, yeah. I need you to hold it and not take away that moment from us by going away. Do you know what I mean? Totally, yeah. And it's also the thing that you repeat all the time, mm -hmm. the same way. Yeah. So when you go in on Steve and I need you to go in on them too, like crazy, like yeah. crazy, like insane, right? Where it's like, yeah, where no. does that even come yeah, from? She's psychotic, yeah. Right, because yeah, this totally. group, the group is like, what is that group? They're like a, they all have these weird quirks and they all have right. problems in their own way. And your weird quirk is not only that you talk fast and you're erratic and you have ADD and all that stuff, yeah. but you're also quite violent. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you have vocal violence, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's your, like, your Tourette. <laughs> totally. Yes, you that's what you say. But hold it. Oh, yeah. And then go into the next moment, right? Mm -hmm. It'll have a huge impact. Yes, um, but yeah, that, I think that's so great. So great, so great, so great. Thank you. <laughs>We are talking about monologues today, mm -hmm. right? Often the actor's brain treats it as some kind of separate special thing. It's not. It's exactly the same as any other moment in a script or piece of dialogue or part of the story. It just, uh, you're gonna be up there and there's the audience, just you and them. The only thing that's really happening is that you're having the time of your life. I think that's the goal, you know? If I'm not, having fun while I'm doing this? What the f is the point? <laughs> so I, I think I probably started around like 11, probably when I first signed with uh, my first agent and mostly got into it because I was competing for attention with my brother. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he's an actor too and uh, my parents as well. So it, it was kind of just like born feeling like I was already doing it. Have you written stuff before? Not really, um, and by not really, I mean no, never. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, this uh, this was uh, this was interesting for me. I was like, what should I do? Like, this is like I'm literally giving myself my own material, which I've never done before. But it was kind of awesome. Um, I started acting 12 years ago. No, God, 13 years ago now, I guess. And I spent half my time in Toronto, and then I moved to Vancouver. And I was there till 2013 and then moved back. And uh, yeah, now I'm here. Great. <laughs> uh, what brought you to the monologue slam? Yeah, that's a funny uh, story. I um, was coming with my friend Kaylee and we were just gonna watch. The more me and my friend watched, the more we were like, oh, we should, we should do it. Yeah. And then there was a, a wild card thing and I got up and, nice. and uh, yeah, I got hooked so I just, Kept on doing it, and I and it formed uh, some of my really good friends and the community, and nice. um, and that was one of the things I felt I was lacking when I moved back to Toronto. I felt like, oh man, like I don't know anyone that's doing this anymore. Like I, a lot of the people that I acted with before I left for Vancouver quit, mm -hmm. or they moved to LA, mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't really know anyone here anymore. And it really gave me a sense of community again. <laughs> So next up to the stage, this is the only actor that holds a distinct title of being a monologue slam champion and a tag team slam champion. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Make some noise for Derek Gilroy! <laughs> okay, so I met her at Chicago O'Hare Airport. I was on a uh, two hour layover from Mexico, right? Seven days and six nights of beaching and boozing. 
So um, I'm sitting at the bar at TGI Fridays, and I ordered myself a Coors Light, some horrible appy, and a salad, and some misguided, att misguided attempt to uh, lead a balanced lifestyle. <laughs> anyway, uh, she comes barreling through the restaurant, right? And she puts down her carry-on and her purse on the bar stool beside me. And all the while she's doing this, she's like frantically texting, you know? Just like, and that usually annoying tap, tap, tap sound was the cutest thing I ever heard, right? <laughs> and, uh, and then she put her phone down on the bar and just let out this big sigh, you know? Like she had turned a page in her mind, like, oh, that's over, on to the next thing. I was mesmerized. Uh, she had her hair up in that ponytail that she usually does when she's working. And uh, that face, you know, can stop marathon runners in their tracks. And her eyes were so green, a shade of green that you can just get lost in forever. So I guess you could say I loved her from the moment I saw her. Um, <laughs> so I'm sitting there. Now, my friend Eric, my dip friend Eric would say to me, dude, that chick's way out of your league. And he'd be right, except for at this moment, I just come off a of vacation and I was a little bit hungover and the warm fuzzies were still alive and kicking from having such a good time south of the border. So I thought, ah, fortune favors the brave, right? So I muster up some courage and I lean over to her and I say, uh, are you coming or going? Are you coming or going? <laughs> Like, out of all the things that could have stumbled from my lips, those are the words that came out. Smooth, right? Like, just really smooth. And she just looked at me for what seemed like an eternity, and then she smiled. And it was like anything that was ever bad that ever happened to me broke away. It was, uh, I could tell that in that moment, she saw me. And she was looking at me, but she saw past my face and the extra 40 pounds of beer and chicken wings I carry around, and, and she saw uh, me. Uh, she said, going. And I was crossing my fingers and toes, hoping she'd say Toronto. I was like, where to? The six, she says, and like all the air just went out of the room. I just smiled. You know, in that moment, I was truly happy. I was just sitting there, staring at her, smiling for so long. <laughs> and, then, and then finally, my voice decided to show up, and I managed to squeak out, oh, yeah, baby, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and she smiled again, and I melted. And we started talking, and I switched my seat so I could sit with her on the flight. And I was in a bliss-filled haze for the next three and a half years that we were together. And it was that sound, um, that sound of uh, crunching metal and broken glass that snapped me out of it. I, uh, I woke up upside down and my head hurt. And when my vision came back to me, I looked beside me and she was just sitting there with her eyes wide open. Her eyes. I tried to find her, you know, to delve, just delve and dive back into those green eyes again and get lost. She was gone. So, uh, the snow was falling and I wiped the blood from my face. And I, uh, and I pulled her out of the car and I sat in the ditch and just stroked her hair. It was so quiet. I just wanted to scream, you know? I wanted to snap her out of it. I, I wanted her to tell me to go pick up my socks or to point at her lips and smile so that I can kiss them. I, I wanted her to tell me to slow down. Then I was driving too fast. I wanted that more than anything. But she just lay there, heavy, still. so quiet. It's still quiet. That was stunning. Um, I have a, a 
it begins difficultly because it's expository off the top. Mm -hmm. uh, and I wanted it to be more, di more immediate, mm -hmm. you know? Sure. Uh, and, and so I think it could be tightened up. Okay. It, but in terms of its emotional arc and where it goes and discovery, um, it was a tremendous journey to think with you. I, the whole time, I literally felt like it was just the two of us hanging and you were mm -hmm. just telling me the story. Yeah. And uh, I always appreciate how, how vulnerable you can be up there. It's such a gift. Um, yeah, I, I didn't have any notes. I, I always would like to say I, I would have liked to see you standing. That's the only thing, just because yeah. I just feel like I just want more Derek. But um, that's it, man. Good work. I like you sitting. Um, I, <laughs> um, I like you sitting. I want the beginning part more Derek. When okay. Derek's telling me a story. Yeah, yeah. Because you are so um, fun and animated and you paint a scene, man. So I would like to see more of you in there. So therefore, when the other parts come, I don't even expect you were even gonna go there. Yeah. So it also has that arc, right? But I mean, brilliant storytelling. Mm, no, yeah. even though there's lots to tighten up, yeah. brilliant storytelling. Oh, thank you. Thank you for Thanks. that.